However, if you could take a treatment way back to when they first get this diagnosis, and so instead of getting a treatment which currently is wait and watch, and that's what it's called, wait and watch, and when it gets worse, then we'll treat you. If you could make an intervention then, why would you not? Why would you not take an intervention that could prevent vision loss rather than waiting till it happened and then saying, right now I can give you an injection? Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of In Focus. I'm Julie Slosser, Therapeutic Strategy Director at Lexitas, and I'm very excited to have Dr. Catherine Beach with us today. Catherine is CEO of a biotech company called Exonate, and I have really been looking forward to our conversation today and having Catherine join us. Thank you so much for being here. It's absolutely lovely, and thank you very much for inviting me. Of course. So as I mentioned, Exonate is a cutting edge biotech company based in the UK and focused specifically in ophthalmology. Um, can you share with us a little bit more about the company and also your professional background? Yes, the um, company was formed in 2014, specifically to do splice variation of splicing factor kinases. And we had a choice of various therapeutic areas that we could go into, and we chose ophthalmology for very specific reasons. The, the first one was that we thought ophthalmology was a place where there was a real medical need and that we thought we could add some some benefit to humanity by getting um, away from injections into the eye, into eye drops. And then secondly, one of our founders' fathers actually had wet age-related macular degeneration and he was getting injections into his eye and had told his son how unpleasant they were and how he didn't like them. And so we thought, well, actually, this is an area where we have a, a personal emotional link, so let's go down that route. So that was primarily why we chose ophthalmology. My background is medicine. Then I went into large pharmaceutical companies. Then I started doing investment in early stage biotech companies. And this particular intellectual property was brought to me initially by one of the universities whose professors had discovered splicing factor kinases and manipulation. And we, um, decided that we could bring in some chemistry from from Australia, we could bring in some further intellectual property from Bristol University, and we could package this up and make a company. So that's basically the background to the company and why we're here. So your leading program is in diabetic eye disease. And as you mentioned, there are a number of effective treatments that are currently approved for treating diabetic eye disease, specifically DME, and even more recently approvals in diabetic retinopathy. What excites you most about your particular product and um, the opportunity to have a therapy available that is different than an intravitreal injection for these patients? You're, you're absolutely right. There are some very, very effective treatments. However, these are quite invasive in that they involve an injection directly into the eye. And because of that, you find that those treatments are delayed until people actually begin to get a visual loss so when you think of a diabetic, what happens is some people have poor glycemic control. They then begin to get end organ damage. And in the back of the eye, this begins that you start getting leaky blood vessels, following onto a retinopathy, followed onto edema at the back of the eye. And it's the edema around the macula that actually causes you to lose vision. Now, patients generally don't notice anything at all until they start to lose vision and their sight deteriorates. And it's at that stage that they are willing to take invasive therapies because it's affecting their lives. Perhaps they can't read so well. Perhaps they can't see faces so well. Perhaps they can no longer drive. And at that stage, they are willing and will accept an injection into their eye. However, if you could take a treatment way back to when they first get this diagnosis, and so instead of getting a treatment which currently is wait and watch, and that's what it's called, wait and watch, and when it gets worse, then we'll treat you. If you could make an intervention then, why would you not? Why would you not take an intervention that could prevent vision loss rather than waiting till it happened and then saying, right now I can give you an injection. So that was our major driver to say, let's make this an eye drop. Let's make this something that people can get very early in their disease and perhaps save sight rather than salvage sight. So it sounds like there's a huge opportunity right after someone is even diagnosed with 
diagnosed. That we think there is, yes. Or they're in the stage of their disease before vision starts to, to be impacted. Yeah. So this is exciting to have the potential of an eye drop for intervening earlier in patients' disease that have diabetic eye disease and, and hopefully preventing some of the, the downstream effects of vision loss and more severe, severe disease um, down the line. Can you share a little bit more about the science and how this, um, this particular compound gets to the back of the eye? Yes. So the science, the, the reason the company is called Exon8 is because we make a change at Exxon number eight. So it's a real play on words. What we are doing is manipulating mRNA. And we do this by hitting a kinase, which is called SRPK1. We have found, in fact, one of our scientific founders is the inventor, that by inhibiting SRPK1, you can modify the isoform that VEGF exists in. So the body is very clever and the body conserves proteins in order to do various functions. And so currently, if you have an injury and you need to make new blood vessels in order to heal, that you increase, you upregulate the amount of VEGF 165A in that particular organ. So really locally, this causes new blood vessels to grow. Then when you've healed it, you downregulate that and you get back to the balance with 165B, which causes it to stop growing. So the body can do this naturally, but in certain disease states, you get a pathological upregulation of A, which then means you keep growing new blood vessels and they're not as good quality and they leak. So what we are doing is by hitting this, redressing that balance in a diseased tissue so that the pathological A is decreased. There's a slight decrease in total VEGF, but we, we actually have more B, therefore we stop the blood vessel growth. So it was the first discovery. Because we can make it as a small molecule, we knew that we should be able to get a small molecule to the back of the eye. And if you look at, say, steroids, you apply a steroid to the front of the eye, it gets to the back because we know it does and it causes side effects. So we absolutely knew you could get a small molecule there. It was just a matter of finding one that got there by being applied to the front of the eye as a drop. So it goes round the back through the conjunctiva and comes in through the sclera, into the retina, around the macula and stops this new blood vessel growth. So we stop the amount of leaking that's happening. So it does not go through the eye completely from front to back. It sort of goes around the side. Fantastic. You um, have recently completed a successful phase 1B2A clinical trial in DME, yes. which is compound. So can you share with us a little bit about what you're seeing so far in terms of results? Yes, they were very encouraging. Obviously, the, the first in man study is always looking primarily at safety and then tolerability. We had no safety issues at all. We had no serious adverse events that were related to our eye drops. We had specifically tried to make an eye drop that had a very short half-life in the systemic circulation, which would then allow you to have a minimal amount of liability and few side effects. And that was a replicate. That was exactly what we saw. We then wanted to make sure it was well tolerated. We didn't want patients to put these eye drops in, get sharp pain, get stinging in their eye, get a red eye. So that was very important. And we hadn't seen any tolerability issues in animals. And we absolutely saw none in patients. We didn't lose a single patient to tolerability or safety issues. Wow. One of the more important things, though, was the encouraging biological effect we got at the back at the back of the eye. Now, this study was not statistically powered to show efficacy. So what we were looking for was an exploratory endpoint. We wanted to see, does the drop get to the back of the eye and does it do something when it gets there? So we were looking at blood vessel leakage and we saw in patients with fluorescein angiography that we absolutely improved leakage. Those patients who were on our active compound had less leakage, a real decrease in leakage at the back of the eye, while those patients, diabetic patients who were on placebo, continued to get leakage and they had an increase in leakage over the duration of the study. So that's a very encouraging result. We also found that in the edema, patients who had edema around their macula, that we saw a decrease in edema from the screening visit through to the end of the study three months later in those patients, which again was statistically significant. So the, 
we do know we get there, we have a biological effect. And what we now need to do in phase two is find out exactly what is our optimum dose in patients and um, take it for a longer duration to make sure it is safe, it is well tolerated and that it does work. Great, so it sounds like phase two is on the horizon and something yes. that the company is looking forward to in the near future. Yes, it's going to be very exciting and we hope to start that in 2024. Great. Um, Exonate has an interesting financing model too. This was something that I found interesting with the company and the fact that you have some angel investors who are also partnering with the company as you move the company and your programs forward. Yes. Uh, where did this, why you, you chose to go this path uh, with your with the model to support the company and what makes that unique? Um, normally when you, you get a biotech company, they start off with sort of family and friends around a seed capital, and then they move on to venture capital onto venture capital as investors. We were very fortunate. We set off down the road with a group of angels and some money from the seed funds of the universities where we took the IP from. But we then um, had applied for a Welcome Trust Seeding Drug Discovery Award, which we were lucky enough to get. So we were able to not quite take our Series A. We then were, were approached and did a collaboration with a big farmer who paid for our phase one. So we have actually, rather than we chose that road, I think that path chose us. Yeah. And that we have now got to the stage where we have a very credible phase two asset and we have got here and taking minimal equity investment from business angels. So um, a lot of people invest in companies because of an emotional reason, rather than you know that they can make a choice of any pharmaceutical company, it's even listed, but they choose a, a startup because there's something there that they wish to benefit mankind from. It's much more an altruistic sort of investment in those early days. And our angels are very committed, very supportive, talk to us all the time. So it's great. It's a good relationship. Wow. That's fantastic. Um, and love the personal connection that you have with those that are that are partnering with the company as you continue to move forward. Yeah. So this is an exciting program that you all have moving forward. It's an exciting time to be in Retina. There's a lot of amazing treatments that are on the horizon. And as you're along that development journey, I'm sure there's a lot of learnings along the way too. Is there any advice or just learnings that you've had that you'd like to share with other small biotechs as they're embarking on clinical programs that they're getting off the ground and just anything that you'd like to share with them that you've learned along the way with your program? Yes. Um, inside the company, we did not have a, a huge amount of expertise in ophthalmology trials. You know, nobody had done them. Um, we were cutting edge and putting um, drops into the back of the eye. And therefore, we sought the best clinical advisory board that we could get. So we approached individuals who were really the top of their game and persuaded them. And this was very early days before we'd even gone into lead optimization, but persuaded them of the benefits of trying to hit this holy grail of getting an eye drop that went to the back of the eye that could um, preserve vision in people with early stage disease. So I think my advice would be get the best advisors that you can. Um, try to use your personal passion and enthusiasm to engage with people who also become passionate, who then will support you without sort of draining the coffers of your bank account at the same time. And I think we've managed to do that with our clinical advisory board. And it has meant that when we've designed clinical trials, we have got a huge amount of data in those studies. We've managed to get PIs very engaged in recruiting patients, and it's just been a fantastic relationship. Well, I cannot wait to see how this program continues to evolve. And I'm sure that I speak for all of our listeners with that. I thank you so much for being here with us today and wishing Exonate and you and your team all the best as you move thank your you. forward into phase two. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Nice to talk to you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this edition of In Focus. We'll see you next time.